This is Shane Ross with a tutorial on how to export a QuickTime movie from Final Cut Pro with burned-in timecode. Well, in this tutorial, I'm going to explain three ways to do it, and I'm going to save the one that I prefer for last. Now, the filter that we're going to be using is built in in Final Cut Pro. It's in the Effects tab under Video Filters. Scroll down here to the bottom to Video. Click on that and go Timecode Reader. Now, there's also a Timecode Generator, but what that does is it actually generates fresh timecode from a set number. It defaults to 000. Um, I don't want that. I would like to have the time code reader read me the exact time code as it appears. But if I take this and just drop it on one of the clips I have in the timeline as it is right now, it's going to give me the source time code from the clip itself. The clip's time code. Well, I don't want that. I want to have the time code from the entire timeline. Now, this is what you actually wanted. If you wanted the source time code on all these clips, well, then you can stop watching right now. I've solved your question. But that's not what I want to do for this tutorial. I'm going to undo this and proceed to show you how to do it to the entire sequence. Okay, one way is to highlight everything, go to the Sequence menu, and choose Nest Items. Yep, that's okay. Click on that. Now what this does is it nests all the items as one solid clip, and it makes the original sequence that I had this nest. The one that we just created back here, Sizzle-4, that's the original. If I open that up, that's our original sequence as it existed with all the clips. So the Revenge 812 here has just become one solid clip. So now this will act as one clip. So when I drop the timecode reader on top of this, there, I've got my timecode window. Now I might not want to appear in the bottom because I do happen to have text, uh, lower thirds of people. Let's see if I can find any right now. Yeah, right there. And it's covering it up. So what I need to do is I need to open this in Viewer. If I double clicked on it, it would just open the nest. So I actually need to right click and hit Open in Viewer. And then click on the center by clicking on this little thing right here and see that nice little red dot right there? That's our little target. If I take that and I just drag this up over there, we have it on the side. And we can change the size to whatever we want, say 12, make it smaller. If you want to make it really obnoxiously big, there we go. That's just a bit too much. Let's go back a couple steps. Now, the reason I don't like to use nesting is because look what it's done to my render bar right here. Every single clip needs to be rendered now. I don't want to do that. That's, you know, if you have a really long clip and you have some complex renders in there that might take forever, you're rendering everything again. This is why I don't prefer nesting. I'm going to undo a couple steps here. There we go. I've undone my nest. Now, the way that I used to do it is I would highlight everything, and now I go File, Export, QuickTime Movie, and I would export a reference movie. That means I wouldn't make it self-contained. I would make it as a movie that references all the media and all the renders as it exists on the drives. So it's going to take a little bit quicker to do it because I don't want it self-contained. I'm just going to use this reference movie for a little bit and then throw it out. So I'm going to have this appear on my desktop right there. I'm going to click Save. There, that didn't take too long. So let me go ahead and hide this just to show you that right here is my clip. I can open it up just by hitting the space bar and give us a nice view. How many of us are there? There we go. That's our clip. Close that. Now what I would do is I would go File, Import, Files, click on my desktop, click on that clip, and click Choose. That clip appears right down there. I'm going to make a new sequence now. And I'm going to drag this clip down there. Yes, I do. Alrighty. Now I have another standalone clip, but this time when I add the timecode reader effect to it, like that, well, I still get a render bar, but it's not going to be quite as bad as the other one. If you have a lot of effects to render and stuff like this, and they're like heavy effects, it'll probably take a long time to render, whereas this, you have a light green render bar, so when you render this one out, it won't take nearly as long. Now this one you can easily double click on to open it up in the viewer, go to filters, and then just drag this wherever you want to go, like up there. But again, this adds to your render time. And while this is the old way I used to do it, and you still can do it if you'd like to, this isn't my preferred method. Okay, let me hide this. What I like to do is I like to use compressor. Compressor. I like to use compressor because it'll add the time code while it's compressing it. It's kind of a two-in-one step. So let me go ahead and add my let me go desktop, grab my file, drop it to the drop zone right there. Okay, go back to compressor. And then I'm going to go down here and I'm going to choose one of my presets. Uh, let me go ahead and just choose the land streaming. Drag that on there. And if I click on this, 
and come down here to the inspector, I have a few options down here to choose from. Well, the one I want to choose is called filters, and that's that guy right there. We'll click on that, and we have all these options that we can add on here. And I want to scroll down all the way to timecode generator. Now, one thing that's cool is if you want to add a watermark for security reasons, you can add a watermark, which would be like a graphic for your company that you can also overlay in the middle area right here for added security. Now, my time code defaults lower right and it's black, and you can't see it right there because, well, it's black. So I'm going to change the color to something brighter, but I might have some white in the skies or something like that, so it still wouldn't show up. I like to make this bright red. Click OK. Close that, and, and there it is. It's a little small. Well, let's make that a little bit bigger so we can click Select Font, and then just make this a 24 or about 48. Yeah, 48 isn't too bad. Let's actually go up one more to 64. There we go. And I want to make it not lower right title save, but upper right. Now, if I was making a DVD, I would do upper right title save. But I'm not going to be making a DVD this time. I'm going to be sending this out as a QuickTime movie on the web or as a little QuickTime file for my audio composer. So I'm just going to choose upper right. That gets it way out of the way up there. Now the one drawback to doing this way is we don't have that nice little black box around it. It does only show up as those numbers and you can't do a drop shadow, which is why I choose red and you can still make it out most of the time. So now we just go ahead and submit this. Hit submit. Okay, let's let this compress. Go have a cup of coffee and be right back. There, done. Okay, let's quit this, not save it, and look at our result. Hide that. Our result is down here, double click on it, and there we go. Time code on the top all the way through, and pretty darn easy to see. Now actually there's a fourth way that I like to do because sometimes all this compressing and rendering and authoring a DVD takes a long time. My favorite way to do this that's actually in real time is to go ahead and do that reference movie right here, bring it back in and throw this little time code window up here and then connect the DVD recorder to my capture card and then just press record on the DVD recorder and then play on my timeline and watch it happen in real time and then stop and then author that DVD. But not everyone has that, so one of these three methods might be the one you want to choose. Alright, that does it for this tutorial. Thank you very much for listening. Now get back to work.